What the fuck is up? Welcome back. My name is Noah Hills. You can find me on Twitter at Noah More Parties. You can find my written work and my rankings for uh, running backs in Dynasty Leagues, Debbie Leagues, and Rookie Drafts at NoahMoreParties.com. And I'm here today to save you from yourselves because you're still, you're, st- you're no longer selecting him at RB2. You're no longer selecting him at RB4, but you're still overdrafting Kenneth Walker in Dynasty Startups. Let's get into it. <laughs> The general deal on Kenneth Walker coming out of college was that he was slightly undersized at 211 pounds, which has, you know, various implications about his potential workload. Not impossible to get a strong workload at that size. Dalvin Cook has done it. But larger guys tend to get bigger workloads, and it's just true that he's slightly undersized. So there's that, whatever whatever that's worth. The other part was that he is a great runner. Like, he was one of the best pure two down runners on a per carry basis from a volume perspective that we've seen in the last 10, 15, whatever years in college football, incredibly efficient, dominant on a per carry basis in two different power five conferences, excellent as a junior in the big 10 with Michigan state. He broke a ton of tackles. He ripped off a ton of long runs. He was consistent on a down to down basis, not just relying on those long runs for his production. He was just really, really good as a pure runner in college. So we were like banking on him being a beast on the ground in the NFL because the other element to his profile, despite lots of people claiming otherwise or, you know, wish casting their way out of actually confronting this about their profile, Kenneth Walker was not a receiver at all in college. Historically inefficient on historically low volume. Like there was really no indication that he would be a quality receiver out of the backfield in the NFL, despite you know, him catching a swing pass in a training camp session and Pete Carroll talking him up uh, as a three down back. Turns out what actually matters is what he displayed in college. And that was that he's not a great pass catcher. And so after year one, what what did we get right? and What did we get wrong with the Kenneth Walker profile? Number one, we were, we, I say we to be kind. I, along with the others who anticipated him not being a good receiver and not the people who said, He just wasn't asked to do it in college. Look at his high school stats. Those people were wrong. But I and the others like me were spot on that this guy was not a receiver. He got 27 passes uh, last season, despite having over, what, 200... He had 228 carries, I think. Only caught 27 passes. Only had 35 targets. He had 65th percentile route participation. Like, he was running a lot of routes. It wasn't that they were just weren't using him in the passing game, because he was running a lot of routes but a 45th percentile target share. So despite high route participation, low, below average target share, and on a per route basis, adjusted for the types of routes that he was running, he had a 26th percentile as far as how many targets he's earning on a per route basis. So very, very low in that area. And then when he was getting targeted, out of 79 running backs last year who had at least 10 receptions in 2022, uh, Kenneth Walker ranked 57th out of 69 guys in yards per target, with 4.7. Uh, that's less than guys like Alexander Madison, less than Hassan Haskins. Uh, he averaged 6.1 yards per reception, which was 53rd out of 79 among the same group. And he had a 77.1% catch rate, which ranked 43rd out of 79 among the same group. And that was that was on a negative 2.1 A dot. He was catching passes an average of two yards backwards. Like these were not advanced targets where he's like beating coverage and like fighting for the ball you know, with some DB hanging on him. This is, he's standing in the flat wide open or catching a screen or, you know, things like that. Like super, like the easiest that targets get for running backs is what Kenneth, was what Kenneth Walker was getting. And he, A, wasn't catching very many of them and B, not doing much with them when they were thrown his way. Like he just, he's not a good receiver. He wasn't in college. He wasn't in the NFL. And his offensive coordinator in Seattle is Shane Waldron, who was the previous passing game coordinator Uh, for the Los Angeles Rams. The last Shane Waldron running back who had even 50 targets in a season was prime Todd Gurley in 2018 on an 86% snap share. That's ridiculously high. Uh, We know back then Todd Gurley was maybe the best running back in the league uh, during that late 2010 stretch, but also the offense in Los Angeles led by Jared Goff, like just getting absolutely fed Kenneth Walker is not going to see an 86% snap share with Charbonnet on the team, and he's not going to earn targets otherwise because 
Shane Waldron running backs don't often get targeted. Zach Charbonnet is there. Geno Smith has historically targeted running backs at a low per route rate. And Kenneth Walker himself does not possess the requisite receiving skills in order to command receiving volume in the face of those situational factors. Having said that, let's look at him as a as a runner. Like, okay, he's not a receiver. He's not going to be productive as a receiver going forward. We had mixed results on him as a runner, you know, as a stud runner in year one. Negative 0.08 rushing yards over expected per attempt. Not great. That's obviously under expectation. So he was, based on the situations he was carrying the ball in, he was producing less than we would expect from an average running back in the NFL. His box adjusted efficiency rating, which compares him to his teammates and adjusts things for the kinds of box counts that he's seeing, 93.7%. So he's producing less than what his teammates were producing uh, given the situations they were carrying the ball. And that's a 39th percentile number. But especially bad was his relative success rate. Like he was super boom bust. He had some long runs, decent breakaway run rate, actually a pretty good breakaway run rate. But his his relative success rate of, of negative 5.8% was really bad. 25th percentile basically means that given the box counts that he was seeing, he succeeded on 6% fewer of his carries than the collective other running backs in Seattle did. So super inconsistent while also not being efficient despite some big plays that would, you know, hypothetically buoy his efficiency numbers, but weren't enough to make up for him just being kind of bad last year. However, he did turn things around a little bit towards the end of the season. He went 90 for 401, uh, with three 100-yard games while stacking positive rushing yards over expected in the last four weeks of the season. It's usually usually irresponsible to make, you know, projections based on these small sample improvements. If, you know, there's, you can go around the league and isolate most players' performance to like three or four games and be like, oh, if we just pay attention to that, this guy's a stud. Or, oh, if we, if we just pay attention to these four shitty weeks, like this guy actually sucks. Like, you can play that game with pretty much anybody, but it, It seems relevant that that happened at the end of a rookie season where Walker, you know, you could tell yourself the story where he was acclimating to the league, had some growing pains, uh, but then kind of figured things out towards the end. And especially given how good he was in college on the ground, I'm personally willing to walk down Narrative Street in that area and kind of give him the benefit of the doubt as a guy we should expect to be a quality runner going forward. But everything is kind of fucked up by the fact that Zach Charbonnet was picked in the second round by Seattle last month. It just makes this a very tight needle to thread here because Walker is now a is now completely reliant on being one of the best two-down runners in the league because he's not going to catch passes because he never has given the situational factors, plus Charbonnet, who I don't think is a great receiver either, but he's at least a reliable, like, checkdown guy, where Walker is not. Walker's not going to have the passing game role, so he's not going to catch passes, uh, and he's not going to get workhorse volume with another guy in Charbonnet in the backfield who can split the load with him, who is also a fairly quality runner as a workhorse in multiple Power 5 conferences in college. And while I think that Kenneth Walker can be one of the best two-down runners in the league, The only evidence we have from him in the NFL is of him not being a good two-down runner, let alone being one of the best in the league. Like, he just, he was below average last season. So it becomes harder to justify being super high on him based purely on his abilities as a runner, and that's really the only thing he has going for him. To kind of illustrate how tight the needle is to thread on that sort of archetype, being good in fantasy football. Since the year 2000, so in the last 22 years, this is the complete list of running backs who have produced at least 15 PPR points per game in one season. 15 points per game is approximately like the RB14 in a given. It's it's like low-end RB1, high-end RB2 level production. So the list of running backs who produced 15 or more PPR points per game on fewer than 255 carries which would be 15 per game over a 17-game season and would have been ninth in the league last year. So that's heavy volume. Walker had like 228 carries last year. This would be a bump up in volume for him despite Charbonnet now being on the team. But let's say he gets 15 carries per game. He can max out at that and still qualify for this list. So 15 plus PPR points per game, less than 255 carries, and fewer than 40 receptions, which would be 13 more. That's like a a 50% improvement over what he had last year. So even if we bump up his volume in spite of Charbonnet being added to the team, but we cap it at 255, cap it at 40, the guys in the last 22 years who on that level of volume have produced at least 15 plus points per game, 2004 Larry Johnson on the Chiefs, 2019 Mark Ingram, I don't remember if that was the Saints or the Ravens, but it doesn't really matter. 2004 Larry Johnson, 2019 Mark Ingram, 
That's it. That's everybody in the last 22 years who's been at least a low-end RB1 on less than 255 carries and less than 40 receptions in a single season. Even if Walker turns out to be one of the best runners in the league, the fantasy upside is capped because he doesn't catch passes and is unlikely to get a ton of volume. A good example of this is Nick Chubb. Nick Chubb has the third highest yards per carry average among all running backs in NFL history. I believe it's Marion Motley who played in like the 40s. And then it's, I don't remember if it's Jim Brown or Jamal Charles, but it's one of those two guys. So like historic volume or historic efficiency for Nick Chubb on a per carry basis as a runner, like incredibly good. He's one of the best running backs in NFL history on a per carry basis. He also averages 274 rushing attempts per 17 games, and he averages 12 touchdowns scored per 17 games. So good volume, good touchdown scoring, one of the best running backs on a per carry basis we've ever seen. He's never finished higher than RB7 in PPR points per game because he doesn't catch passes. Your fantasy upside is capped even with volume that Kenneth Walker's likely not to get, and even with efficiency that any player is unlikely to achieve, it's tough to be an elite fantasy running back. And as the RB8 currently on Keep Trade Cut, and as the RB5 over at bulletproofff.com, which takes, just to show you like what the sample is for that RB5 number, that's real draft ADP pulled from sleeper leagues since the NFL draft. So with the, the Zach Charbonnet information, people in PPR leagues, start 12, are still taking Kenneth Walker as the RB5 in real drafts on sleeper in, since the NFL draft. That is, that's ridiculous. Even a Nick Chubb career outcome would be a wash at that current value. Like it, it, even if, if Kenneth Walker maxes out as the RB7 on a points per game basis in PPR over the next, you know, the course of his rookie contract, let's say, He's got a couple low-end RB1 rookie se- or a couple low-end RB1 seasons, maxes out as a mid RB1. Like you gained no value on taking him at either RB8 or RB5 really. Uh, and and it seems unlikely that Walker will a get the 274 carries a year that Nick Chubb's gotten with Charbonnet on the team throughout the rest of Kenneth Walker's rookie contract. Like Charbonnet's Charbonnet's going to be there unless one of them gets traded. Charbonnet's going to be on Walker's team that entire time eating into his volume both as a runner and pretty much taking away all of his volume as a receiver. It's also unlikely that Walker will be perform as one of the best running backs in NFL history on a per carry basis, because while I think he's probably a good runner, given what he did in college, given he turned it around a little bit at the end of last season, the biggest evidence we have for him is not being a good runner in the NFL, and it's unlikely that anyone turns out to be Nick Chubb anyway. I think it's I think it's much more likely that Kenneth Walker is like a Julius Jones, Willie Parker type guy who can like smash for a season as you know a season at a time if Charbonnet gets hurt for you know 6 weeks in a row or something Kenneth Walker's volume will spike or you know maybe he just scores a ton of touchdowns one year or you know wh- whatever it is he's i think he's more of that type of guy who can smash for like a season at a time but is mostly an explosive committee back who doesn't catch passes doesn't get volume or and really doesn't reliably produce like a fantasy rb1 it's more reasonable where he's going on best ball drafts at underdog right now uh, he's the rb14 over there but i don't see why his seasonal outlook over the next couple years would be drastically different than it currently is this season. Like if he's, if we're expecting him to produce as a high-end RB2 this season, which I think is fairly reasonable uh, as the RB14, that seems that 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 seems reasonable to me where he's going on underdog right now. What's going to change drastically between 2023 and 2024 to make him deliver on RB5 prices in Dynasty or from now to 2025? Like Charbonnet is still going to be around. Like uh, what what are we hoping for where he's currently being drafted? expecting to produce as a high-end RB2, but in Dynasty, we're drafting him as a mid-RB1 at worst and as the RB5 at the peak? Like, doesn't make much sense. Do better. You're currently overdrafting Kenneth Walker in Dynasty. Stop it.